Right, thank you, Nick, for the introduction. And thank you, thank you, uh, Jim, uh, for helping set everything up. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Adam Rankin, and I'll be talking to you about the, how the Australian Imperial Force uh, solved the gunnery problem in the First World War using the Battle of Montrahane as a case study. On 26 September, the first of four major Allied offensives stretching from Verdun to the North Sea was launched by the French and American forces. On 29 September, the Australian Corps, as part of the British Fourth Army, attacked the Hindenburg Line over the Bellacourt Tunnel. By 4 October, Fourth Army had breached the Hindenburg Line and its support line, the Borivor Line, in several places. The sole remaining division of the Australian Corps in line, the second, was due for relief. However, before they were relieved, the 6th Brigade was ordered to capture the village of Montbrahane, about one mile east of the Boer War Line. By 1918, significant technical and tactical advances had been made on the Western Front that enabled artillery to use predicted fire, or fire that was calculated instead of ranged. Multiple tactical, technical, and technological innovations were required to bring this about. I'll focus on those in bold, and mo most of which depended upon accurate survey and mapping, or improved methods of intelligence collection and to provide target locations. The Western Front was ex extensively surveyed during the war, which provided large-scale maps for operations and a trigonometrical framework for artillery survey. From 1916, field survey companies, and from 1917, core topographical sections provided artillery boards, bearing pickets, and plane table resection for both heavy and field artillery. This allowed for accurate determination of position, line, and firing arcs for each battery. Flash spotting and sound raging posts were also able to be fixed to the necessary precision for the, to function. Improved techniques of aerial photography, such as rectification, allowed for the correction of distortion and other errors, and enabled mapping of enemy territory and current details in enemy trenches. After several false starts, sound raging sections were in place across the Western Front and were a significant source of enemy, enemy battery locations. Since they could determine caliber and the enemy target, they were useful in compiling hostile battery locations. Sound raging was effective in fog and rain when aerial and visual observations were degraded, but limited by mobility issues and the prevailing wind on the Western Front, which blew toward enemy guns and scattered the sound report. Observation groups developed at the same time as sound ranging. Once groups were equipped with the sound and flash buzzer to synchronize all posts on the same target, their accuracy substantially increased. Observation groups were also used beginning in 1917 for ranging, including high burst ranging, where the target was uh, precisely known on a map, but not, be, but not in view. They were more mobile than sound ranging and provided a cross check of their work. Calibration screens use, utilize sound ranging principles to calculate muzzle velocity, jump, and droop for guns and howitzers. Army ranges could, could, uh, ranges could calibrate a division's worth of artillery per day. As the field artillery had seen much use, this was a crucial element of accuracy. Similarly, the issue of meteor telegrams provided the environmental correction of the moment. From August 1918, a special telegram covered the early morning period when most deliberate attacks occurred. The Royal Air Force was a huge contributor to artillery effectiveness. First of all, the RAF had secured air superiority, which was a prerequisite for the core squadrons to do their work. Photographic reconnaissance was a primary method of target location and assisted in mapping. Each core squadron worked to keep at least one machine in the air during all flying hours and enabled the artillery to conduct defensive and neutralization shoots to continue the counter-battery fight. Poor weather frequently grounded aircraft, and while they were equipped with wireless, the bandwidth was limited. Workarounds, such as the clock code and, and the zone call square, made the best of the situation, but the existing system still demanded the utmost cooperation between art artillery and aerial observers. The artillery organization during the Hindenburg Line campaign ex ex emphasized flexibility, but was able to concentrate artillery at division, corps, and army level as needed to provide the fire support component of the infantry plan. Divisional and Army field artillery brigades were standardized 
and allocated as needed. Artillery at corps level was under the general officer commanding Royal Artillery, with the commander heavy artillery subordinate to him. Artillery was subgrouped under CRAs or brigade commanders, and Australian and British artillery was, were swapped in and out as needed. By 1917, a counter-battery staff office was being formed in every corps to act as a nerve center for artillery intelligence and to control the counter-battery fight. While each individual component of the, of the intelligence system had limitations, the collection and collation of all sources enhanced reliability and enabled the Corps and enabled the Corps to maintain a comprehensive list of hostile batteries on the front. The CBSO used the list as a targeting scheme with the assistance of aerial observers. When not in active operation, destructive shoots were scheduled. In the final offensives, ne nearly two-thirds of the heavy artillery was under direction of the CBSO and worked to neutralize any enemy artillery that could threaten attacks. Turning back to Montferhain, the attack plan for Montferhain put the 24th Battalion on the left and the 21st Battalion on the right. The 24th would attack on the front of three, three companies, while the 21st attacked with two reinforced companies with two platoons in reserve. The 2nd Pioneer Battalion would form up behind the 21st and 24th Battalions. Each battalion had atta attached Vickers guns and Stokes mortars, as well as four tanks. The objective was a line running to the north and east of Montbrahain, with the Pioneers holding a defensive flank southeast of the village. The field artillery was divided into two groups of four brigades under the overall control of the CRA. The heavy artillery was grouped into a counter-battery group of four brigades and a bombardment group of three brigades. The 73rd Army Brigade was under Army control for deep harassment and counter-battery fight. The speed of the advance had outstripped the mobility of the 8, 9.2, and 12-inch howitzers, and the heavy artillery and fire support was provided by 60-pounders and 6-inch howitzers. All the field and heavy artillery had moved on 4 October, and there was not enough time to have survey support in laying in. The attack would be supported by, by a creeping barrage fired by six brigades, starting 300 yards from the jumping off point. There were two lines of fire, one by 18-pounders and one by 4.5-inch howitzers 200 yards to the east. Each line advanced at a rate of 100 yards per four minutes. The lines would continue until they reached the protective line 500 yards beyond the objective, shown in brown on the map above. The protective barrage would fire until 120 minutes after zero and fire a mixture of smoke, shrapnel, and high explosive. Two brigades of the left group fired at suspected enemy guns and positions, shown as a little air explosion on the map there. After the creeping barrage, the field artillery would provide on-call support for the infantry. The heavy artillery split between extending the field artillery barrage and neutralizing suspected hostile batteries. They also had batteries detailed to answer NF and other priority calls. The principal objective was the neutralization of hostile batteries and positions that could threaten the Australian attack, or to prevent them from consolidating newly won positions. At 6.05 a.m. on 5 October, the 21st and 24th Battalions attacked Montbrahain under cover of the creeping barrage. The barrage was reported ragged and short, falling on both the 21st and 24th Battalions as they closed up to the field artillery start line. German resistance was fierce and included a heavy counter barrage which followed the attacking infantry. Both battalions and, pi and the pioneers were on the objectives by 9 o'clock. As the battalions tried to consolidate the positions, they were subjected to fierce yet uncoordinated counterattacks from three directions. At one point, the Australians were pushed nearly 400 yards back to the village. By mid-afternoon, however, the front lines had stabilized at the boundaries of Montbrahain, which was shorted the object objective in the left sector. The Australians suffered over 400 casualties while inflicting hundreds of losses and capturing over 600 prisoners. Several captured Germans stated that the attack was expected and that additional men and artillery had been brought up. The Germans had extensively shelled assembly areas and behind the, the lines before the attack started as part of counter-preparation fire. The battle was a tough one, with every company commander in both the 21st and 24th battalions either killed or wounded. 
The Australians held the line until the morning of the 6th, when they were relieved by units of the 2nd American Corps. Several fire missions were called in by the forward observation officers and the artillery patrols. These focused on breaking up infantry advancing in skirmishing order, trying to counterattack against the Australians. Several protective barrages were fired and several priority and fleeting targets engaged. The rounds depicted graphically are only a fraction of those fired, with over 25,000 total rounds fired during the day between the 18-pounders and the 4.5-inch howitzers. So drawing it all together, Montprehane showed the strengths and limitations of artillery gunnery as practiced in 1918. Many solutions to the gunnery problem were optimized for the long periods of trench warfare, where the front line would not move for weeks at a time, and where attacks had been deliberate and long prepared. In contrast, the conditions of 1918 were approaching semi-open warfare, and the survey teams, sound rangers, and less mobile heavy artillery could not keep up. Mapping remained up to date, and when weather permitted, aerial observation remained the principal target location method. Overall, artillery and, and surveyed intelligence had fundamentally transformed artillery in the period between 1914 and 1918. Long optimized for trench warfare, strides have been made in many areas in 1917 and 18 to increase mobility, but this remained a serious limitation. Aerial observation provided many answers, but the issue of liaison with both airmen and infantry still remained incomplete. These limitations did not take away from the tremendous strides in accuracy, organization, and effectiveness as demonstrated in the campaigns of 1918. Thank you.